Welcome to the 50th um, American Prairie Association Convention. Um, there's a lot of really cool things that are going on. Um, today I'm going to talk about developing strategies for efficiency. Um, that encompasses both at the anvil and at the horse. Um, there's a lot of aspects um, mentally that are involved with it, um, not to mention uh, your body position at the anvil and the horse. Really affect that. Um, what I'm going to do for the demo, um, I'm going to just kind of, kind of go over a few things. We're going to discuss a little bit of the mental game a little bit first and then um, break it down pretty simple and basic. Go over and do some quick uh, pixie modifications and shaping um, just because shaping um, is one of the harder things that we do uh, to put the feet every day. So go through and do some pick shoes um, and then do some clock issues and then depending on how much time we have left, go through and make some uh, three-quarter fluid shoes, maybe a bar shoe or something. Um, to me, um, one of the, the hardest shoes uh, mentally to do is a concave shoe, just because dealing with that section can be very tricky, keeping it flat, being able to maintain what you want it to do um, throughout the shoe building process. Um, so, game plan-wise, um, lecture um, aspect of it, the main point I want to get across is just to make you think differently than you do in your daily practice, right? Um, just start the gears rolling and get everything kind of where you um, can see things in new lights. Um, it's not necessarily going to give you the trick to make a toe bend faster or get your nails placed in the right place, right? Um, I'm mainly going to be focusing on going through the shoes, um, not breaking down the actual building of the shoe. It's more of how your body affects what you're doing with your tongs and your hammer, your body position at the anvil. Um, it'd be great if we have horse up here as well, because we can find over a bunch of aspects there too. Um, same kind of concept. Um, so when we talk about like the mental aspect of being efficient, um, to me, the, the biggest thing that I can um, portray to you guys is it has to be at a very high skill level. So it's not just being fast. It's also using your effort and your skills very efficiently um, and not wasteful with your effort, but at the same time to a very high standard. We don't want to just knock the horse out really fast and get it done um, and not to a high quality. So um, it's not just about being fast. It's about doing it to a very high quality. Um, so when we go and we start thinking about how we're going to break it down in our mind, um, the, the, the big key points to me are being mindful. Um, we all know what mindful is, right? It's being aware of what's going on, being self-aware, it's being aware of the horse, right? That's where the horsemanship comes into big play, just being aware of what they're going through, um, making sure that we're not putting them in an uncomfortable position or um, making them scared or antsy, you know, we want to be calling to them. Um, and then so, um, appropriate. Um, appropriate is a huge key word to me that can really gain efficiency really fast because if you don't know what appropriate is, you have a really hard time executing it for the horse. Um, it can go into many different aspects here. Appropriate amount of nail, appropriate nail size, appropriate section, appropriate trim, right? You got your appropriate length of the foot to protect that coffin bone, right? Um, we got the appropriate shoe for the discipline, for the environment. It just goes on and on and on and on. And we hear a bunch um, about being appropriate, but at the same time, a lot of times it's not really broken down to determine what is appropriate, right? What is the appropriate section for that foot? You know, how do you determine that? Um, a lot of times you have to just keep banging your head against the wall until all of a sudden you understand why it's appropriate, right? Uh, same thing with your, your uh, shape of heel. That's a massive one that you see. Um, putting the appropriate heel on for the appropriate fit, right? So you can see how it just kind of snowballs. It's, an, it's a huge factor. The more that we understand what is appropriate for all those different things, it makes it that much easier to um, be able to pick and choose which ones we want to do, and at the same time, execute them to a high level and quickly, right? Um, so another big one is intent, right? Purpose. Is there an intent behind everything that you do, right? I'm very much the type of person that is um, obviously a little OCD, or a lot of OCD. Um, 
And if I don't have a reason to do it, I have a really hard time forcing myself to consistently do it and then do it well, right? And then that whole idea of we're shooting horses every day, um, you could say we're just doing the same thing over and over again, but there's so many small little intricate pieces that are different from one foot to the next. You have to be able to um, produce the same thing, but maybe slightly different, right? You gotta have a reason why it's slightly different, right? Um, so having a tent behind it is massive, and it, same thing, it goes from the anvil and it goes to the foot, right? Um, if you don't have a tent behind when you're flattening the shoe, you might not be taking the sole pressure out, and you might actually be putting the sole pressure in, right? Um, on the foot, it's really uh, interesting to me to always go and look and see a bunch of different trim feet by different people and see what I see um, in their trims, and it's not whether or not you agree with it or disagree with it, is can you see if it was on accident, if it was done on purpose, right? If it was kind of something that had an actual meaning behind it or not, or if, well, that's just the way my knife cuts, right? And if it just cuts that way, it's hard to have a tint, right? It's not necessarily a happy accident at that point. Um, so that's a really big one um, as well. And then another one is just discovering your tendencies, right? Um, and that kind of is a mental mind game as much as a physical mind game. Um, it's understanding what you do and what your body does on its own that sometimes we have to fight and change that and sometimes we just got to figure out how we can best use that to our advantage, right? Um, a lot of um, the stuff with the hammer swing and the tongs comes down to just our anatomy, right? It's really easy for our hammer to want to want to pull this way versus it is to push it into a body. And that's just the natural tendencies of our body. But you have to know that mentally to be able to use that to your advantage, right? Um, same thing when you get to a horse. Tendencies of what we do is, is massive at a horse too, because a lot of times what is difficult to do, we have a hard time doing doing it on purpose. Right? Whatever is presented and really easy and exposed to us, we want to do too much of it a lot of times, right? More times than not, when you take a hind foot and put it on a peg, the area that a person is going to top dress first is the medial toe. Not because it needs it, but because when you get underneath the peg, it's the first thing that's presented right in front of you, and there's a massive room to work, right? The horse's body's up, the legs aren't in your way, you're not in your way, and you can do it really easily and efficiently, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's what the horse needs, right? Now, if you look at that place as being the easiest place to trim, and top dress, the hardest place to top dress is that lateral quarter, right? And we all know that typically on hind feet, that's the area that needs the most top dressing, but that's the hardest place to do it, you know what I mean? So it's just kind of, it gets that mind frame of like understanding why we do things and where we do them and, and then put a purpose behind them, right? That intent follows in tendencies, your tendencies a bunch, okay? Um, so, Having all those things kind of placed up there, you know, appropriate intent. Another big one is perspective, right? From your point of view, depending on how you view any of these aspects, they can look completely different, right? A lot of, a lot of times when you go and you pick up a foot, your point of view and perspective of it from the top might not be the same from the bottom, right? And the goal is that we make it look long from the bottom and short from the top. Right? If we can achieve that, then now all of a sudden we have a bunch of vertical depth and we have a lot of protection for that, that coffin line. And that horse is going to probably be a lot more comfortable than if we do it the opposite way. Right? If we bottom it up from the bottom and it looks long from the top, there's something going on. Right? Um, so having that point of view reference is huge. Um, at the angle it goes there as well. Um, a lot of times when you're your perspective of something being square at the anvil isn't necessarily square to the world. You know, you got to think about where we are on the anvil and our eyesight is more over this way, right? So we're going to want to do that to the section, right? And then when we pick it up, all of a sudden we've created it up, you know? So you got to keep in mind that your point of view isn't necessarily always accurate in that aspect too. So, you know, we want to make sure that where we're standing, it might not look square, but then when we're done, it is actually square, okay? So that point of view aspect is is a very key factor in both the horse and the moment as well. So to me, when I'm working every day, I'm keeping in mind all those aspects, appropriate perspective, intent, point of view, you know what I mean? All those things kind of just are rambling around in my head at all times just to be able to keep my
myself as efficient as I can. Um, the big thing to me is when, when we're in our shop and we're forging, um, we're trimming feet while we're building shoes, and when we're trimming feet, we're building shoes in our head. Because then when we bring them together, they just mirror up early. Um, everyday work, my goal is to, when I leave my driveway, is to go do the highest quality that I am capable to do as fast as I can. I'm not there to lollygag and take 15 trips. If it takes 15 trips to do a quality job, I'm good. But the goal should be the next horse, it's 14 trips, 13 trips. Right? The goal is to always be pushing ourselves. And it's really easy when you have 10 horses to see today, 10 horses to see tomorrow, to get in that groove, it's just, it's just the grind. And you just, you just are going through the motions, okay? Um, and that's, that's the biggest thing that I want to disrupt, is that thought process, the grind, and so that you start picking things apart, understand what you do, why you do them, and then get a grasp on all those aspects. Because then it just makes you that much more skilled, that much more efficient and proficient at doing your job, right? So, um, a big thing too, when we go to start to break down kind of the mental game, like I was saying before, the, the shaping is like one of the hardest things that we do. Um, shaping of the shoes to fit the feet. Um, there's obviously a bunch of different shapes. Um, I just do real generic front high shape on the, on the mark board. Um, once we started breaking down shape on the kick shoe, I kind of talked a little bit on how I break that up so that I can kind of see the arcs in the foot really efficiently and quickly. Um, the idea is that when we go up to the horse, is that as we're walking up to it or it's walking up to us, we're breaking down the confirmation, we're breaking down any issues that it has, we're talking with the client, we're getting a game plan of what the uh, living environment is, what the working environment is, what the, the discipline is, all those kind of things. Because all those little things are just little ingredients that get put into a recipe that allow you to create a very successful um, game plan for the person to do its job right there, right? Because we're just here to facilitate the horse in doing their job. Right. Ultimately, we work for the horse, not the owner, in my opinion. Um, so, what we'll go ahead and do is take and get a little bit of the demo start going. Like I was just saying, the big part too is where being efficient in creating this strategy just really comes into play in pretty much all aspects. Um, Anybody that's been through the certification or a competition, you can see the massive improvement in yourself over a short period of time because the, the efficiency to get those tasks done in a period of time really come into play. Um, and it just pushes your, your level really quickly. Even if you don't shoot or build shoes like you did for the certification or the competition, it, it just gains your skill. Okay?
we go through and mark out the front shape, um, it's a compromised pattern. In my opinion, if a person puts in a few key little elements um, in your shape, it just fits feet so much easier. One of those being is a medial toe. Having just a slight uh, change of arc in the medial toe versus um, having a symmetrical toe, it will just go on feet so much easier. Um, doing that, putting that slight little bit of um, change of arc in the medial toe, and then how they fall off to your quarters, right? Typically when we go and we look at um, feet, one side is going to be inside a little bit more than the other, or pretty symmetrical, so when you go and you break down the foot, right, it makes it really easy for you to see if one side comes further out than the other, or one gets tucked in further than the other. And so when they, when they do that, just say it to yourself, it's really easy to be able to take the animal, or take it to the animal and fit the, uh, fit the foot to it. So I'm here, like I said, a little bit of video tone, but I'll that by the recorder. I need to make two points of contact. And only thing to make sure that I follow the suit all the way down.
and my camera wants to pull it to this way, right? So as soon as I saw that, you need to recognize it and start to put yourself into a more proper position so that you can pull it straight across. If you drop your hammer, it pulls this way. If you lift your hammer, it pulls out. Okay? I'm doing the same thing on this one. If you put that slight medium tower, That I'm in the ballpark, 
where do you get that really bad news of, uh, let's go and rebuild it. It's time to fix everything all over, right? And it might be bad enough for you're like, I need a bigger shoe now. You've got to start completely over, okay? And that's why, because again, the thing that trumps everything, in my opinion, is quality work, right? Do what you got to do to get the quality work. If you keep your mindset of doing quality work and always pushing the envelope to try to get faster and faster and faster, that is the key factor in gaining efficiency, okay? And you can say that a bunch of that comes into play with being mindful, being self-aware. Still going to do what I hit, and how it manipulates makes you that much more efficient with your hammer. Um, like I was showing before, we're going and putting that roll toe in, closing my shoe, sole pressure, seeing that out, it's going to open my shoe. Knowing how all that kind of material moves is, is massive because if you put the perfect toe in and then you roll the toe, now you mess your toe up, and vice versa um, for other aspects. So you always want to make sure that you're not doing things twice and that you're pretty much only doing that once. Okay, so you're just going through and doing that out ahead. Plenty of time to go check my fit, see where I'm at, come back. That's, that's my goal, whether I'm flipping, whether I'm doing rocker toe, whether I'm doing saddle bone, whether I'm doing extended heels, so on and so forth. Now with concave, First of all, any questions on the first couple shoes in? Definitely, if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask. Okay. The biggest thing with just going through and kind of doing those gives a baseline of just kind of the shape and kind of my idea of what I'm going to do with one heat, right? Now I'm going to start building the shoe, which not very many of us put handmaids on horses every day, all day. Um, it's kind of one of those things that it can teach you a lot. I found or found that concave shoes is what pretty much taught me the most about forging. Ironically, and there's not much forging in concave shoes because the biggest thing that it taught me is that self-awareness of knowing what I'm doing and my perspective wasn't accurate. Right? Concave is one of those steels where if you're not consistent with what you're doing in doing it with intent, it's going to get all kinds of squirrely, unflat, and do a bunch of things. It makes it a lot harder to do what you want it to do. Okay? So, when you're starting out making shoes, breaking them down to a simple task, knowing exactly what you're going to do per heat is crucial. Because then you can duplicate it consistently, and then you can increase quality, and then once that happens, then you can start taking the heats out of the equation. Right? The big thing, too, in doing that is knowing what tool I'm going to use next. Okay, it's not just at the course that that comes into play, it's also at the forge. So knowing what tool I'm going to need next, knowing exactly what I'm going to do with it, and in what process so that you can duplicate it consistently. So with, with concave, I don't know how many of you guys have worked concave or not, but one of the biggest things that's most consistently seen in concave is a big old pucker at the heel. Okay? That comes from not understanding where the steel is moving and not understanding your point of view of where the material is going from where you've seen it. Okay, what you think is square is not square and so on and so forth. So, I'm not going to necessarily break down how I'm going to go through and, and make it, but just keeping in mind how I'm holding everything and discuss what I see as I'm doing it. Now, I'm not going to, like I said, building the shoes, I don't want to break down and go into how, you know, this is how you build a heel, this is how you build a toe bed, and so on and so forth. It's definitely much more on an aspect of how my body's being affected in my point of view. So with that bump hit on the inner ring really, really, really weak. If you can see it, you can see I'm not holding it square. And I'm not necessarily holding it here. Where I want to hold it is right there because it is rock solid. Right? Because that, that spine is going through the middle of my mass. Okay? But so, I have to force myself to hold it in a manner that is not easy to do, but down, then it allows me to not have that cover come about. 
because it's one of those things that you can't fix. I'm sure we can all agree that concave is one of the most unforgiving sections that we deal with in building shoes. So in doing that process of making that heel, I need to make sure that when I'm going and I'm hitting it, I know exactly how I'm doing it to replicate it and making sure that I prevent big mistakes from happening that I can't take out. The hardest thing to be able to do is get concave flat again once it's puckered down. If we gain sole pressure and we have sole pressure, we can always flat back out, right? But as soon as that inner rim gets pushed down, there's no way for us to grab and push it back down without leaving a bunch of hammer marks and so on and so forth. So when I go to go and take and do the toe bend, Again, being efficient, I need to be able to use my tools so I know the same result's going to come every time. One big factor to that is keeping my suction at a 90 degree going into my boss and my tongs. Okay? The second that I don't have it going into the boss of my tongue anymore, all that wants to do is twist. Now, every hammer blow, all I get is my tongs movement, right, in the toe bend, and the suction doesn't actually move. Okay, so I want to make sure that when I come to do that, I want to make sure that my tongs are in the right place so that I can lift up with my tongs. I don't have to have a death grip on it at that point. It's literally just pushing up the steel. And it's the same aspect whether you do a toe bend on the face or on the arm. Okay? So just keeping that really in my head. And at the same time, looking and seeing how that section is moving. Is it going straight down or is it starting to twist? Right? And that comes into play with your hand. One side of that, or one shoe is going to be easier to do than the other, depending on which side of the strong part of the section is, right? Because our hand wants to do this. So one shoe it wants to put sole pressure in, the other shoe it wants to take it out and then we can't get it back. Okay? So you have to be mindful of keeping that hammer pushing that section flat. In the beginning of making this stuff, or making the pump in, it was very frustrating and discouraging because you're constantly going through and building shoes and building shoes and trying to figure it out. And every shoe is coming out a little different. One shoe come out pretty flat, pretty nice. The next shoe, you thought you did the same thing, and it wouldn't come out very consistent, right? And that's why I say that the pump taught me the most about how I am at my position at the end point and my tendencies are myself, okay?
something that's more of a mental mind game than it is a physical mind game. I'm going to do the same aspect when I go to do my brain spin. I'm really being cautious, or not cautious, but aware of where my tongue position is so that I can push it around the horn. If I don't have a cushion in with the boss and I hold it at a 90, the second I hit it, you can see it exactly does the same thing as my tongue and it just spins. Okay? So to be consistent in getting my brain spin the way that I want, I need to make sure my tongue placement is correct. Once I get past that point with my quarter, as soon as I get the amount of quarter bit that I want in, that's when I can allow myself to start sweeping up. Because if I continue to just keep coming around the anvil, my arc just ramps up faster and faster as it gets to the heel. Okay? And that's not the type of arc that goes and fits feet very well. Okay? So you can see how much radius there is in that quarter there? It's pretty average.
Being able to break down each one of these tasks that we have is crucial at being efficient and able to duplicate it as well. Understanding the crunch line, what makes it be easier, difficult, the punching aspect of it, all of it. The more we break down each individual task that we're doing, whether it's trimming or shimming or forging, the more consistent and efficient we can be out of it. And it comes down to every aspect, even just knifing out a frog. Just understand what you're going to do, what you're trying to emulate, and have that target to go to. Now, the medium ranks needs to be safe, and it needs to be ran up. Again, that appropriate fit. The medium ranks should be fit tighter than the outside. So, in turn, to be able to do that, we need to have a narrow reception. Because in the middle of the field, we're going to see it. So this inside safe thing on Paul Cave is very difficult so to not make this bearing surface rounded. Because as we're taking that outer rim and we're folding it, it's pulling that outer corner in and making a radius. So it should be random, so it should be a smaller section. Okay, because we're going to go for a tighter fit, so middle of heel, middle of steel, to be appropriate. It has to be narrower to get the same fit that we're looking for, right? So if you want a really big full fit, it should be a wider section. Again, that comes back to the appropriate, right? To be an appropriate section is going to be going down the middle for your nails and the appropriate fit. You know, so that all comes into play. But so going through and, and Getting that safe and put on a concave taught me a bunch about not getting that pucker and that rolled off edge on the inside because where we want to hold it to be able to do it, where it's really simple and easy, is like that. Well, as soon as we hold it leaning over, now the inside of the edge wants to roll that way. Right? So again, we have to force ourselves to stay square, if not anything, tipped to the other side. Because if we tip it this direction, now the animal's pulling it. It's a soul pressure. Okay. It sounds really rudimentary basic, but it's really difficult to make ourselves want to do the hard thing versus the easy thing. Okay? And that's where a lot of this forging aspect comes into play. And on this, uh, this side of the shoe, it's really difficult because, again, we're going against our natural body a little bit. We're trying to get in our own way. We're not able to come here and just have a nice swing to it, right? So now we've got two things compounding that make it more difficult. But you just kind of got to go through and embrace the suck. You know, and just force yourself to do it that way. Because you get a lot better in the prompt. But it also shows that you have an understanding of what your body is doing and how the material is moving. And you're making it go there for a purpose. Okay? We don't have to try to get it flat if we didn't make it on flat to start.
but I don't need to spend four or five trips going back and forth to it.
being mindful of what your body does in the tendencies and understand that it's a it's a as much a skill game gain in the physical aspect as it is a mental aspect, right? Break down your tasks, make yourself do things in tenfold. Don't just get into a groove and just repeat. Okay? Keep yourself constantly asking yourself why. The more you ask yourself why, the more you give yourself reasons. Okay?